morning, church. Happy New Year. Wonderful to see you uh, all here this morning and this first Sunday of a new year and first Sunday of uh, what the Lord has in store for us. Uh, that being said, I, I would just like to say a word of thanks. Uh, I've put this in the bulletin. I'm just going to kind of read what I have written here, but um, I'd like to thank each and every one of you for another year in 2021 of faithful service to our Lord. Uh, God has worked through your service, both to, to young and old, male, female, to members and visitors, to our community, uh, for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the growth of his body, the church. That is undoubtedly what has happened in this past year. You've given your time and gifts to teach, to pray, to lead ministries, to prepare and deliver meals, to run special events, to plan and, at important meetings, and in countless other ways. You have stewarded the Lord's wealth to provide for the needs of our church, where in another COVID-19 year, our uh, income uh, exceeded our expenses. You are First Baptist Church. It will always be the gracious work of the Lord through you that defines this church. It is our privilege and all of our privilege to be a part of this church family. Amen? Amen. Thank you. Uh, this morning in particular, too, I'd just like to say a word of thanks to those who are responsible for uh, putting on a Sunday morning service from the worship team who's up here faithfully Sunday after Sunday uh, to the um, booth that is unknown uh, hiding out there. Gilbert's up there this morning running a, a variety of things and often having to deal with technical difficulties uh, to our uh, communion setup, which is here today and is the result of many different women in our deacon and, uh, deaconess board that are putting that together, to our kitchen crew that serves on a rotating basis every Sunday, to our children's classes and our children's uh, leadership and teachers. Uh, this service doesn't happen, this church doesn't happen uh, without you. So thank you as we begin a new year together in 2022. Uh, the other thing I want to I want to just say is uh, I'm sick again. I was sick last week and I got better during the week, and then yesterday and today, it just it is knocking me down again. So uh, because of that, I'm going to keep my distance from you as much as I can. That's also why I was wearing a mask. I've been tested for COVID. I don't have COVID. At least that's what the test says. But in uh, in uh, all caution, I want to make sure that. Uh, I keep my distance, and uh, also I, I think uh, as, I might, I hopefully don't, but I, I think I'll make it through the whole service this morning, but I think if I try and do Sunday evening as well, I at some point might pass out. So uh, unfortunately, we are going to be canceling Sunday evening service again this Sunday, and uh, I, I apologize for that. Now, um, we do still have a chance for some housekeeping here, and I want to let you know of some of these things. First of all, uh, we haven't quite printed out the uh, calendar yet. Uh, we haven't quite printed out the new directory yet. So really, you know, this week is kind of your last chance to make any changes that might need to, need to be made for either of those two things. We'll be printing those out uh, this coming uh, week. And then uh, uh, annual reports. I think we have all the annual reports we need, but uh, if you still need to turn one in, uh, please, please do that as soon as you can. Uh, this week. We're going to be printing those out as well. And then all of this is leading up to next Sunday, right after our service, we're going to have our annual business meeting. So for uh, all members, we uh, very much encourage you to attend that. We'll be reviewing 2021 and what the Lord has done uh, in our church and uh, looking ahead to 2022 to see what the Lord might do and uh, continue in his faithfulness to us. So those are all the announcements I have for you this morning. Uh, let's begin uh, this new year. And let's begin this worship service uh, with a call to worship from our Lord. And he says this to us in Psalm 139. I'll be skipping around a little bit. O Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Where shall I go from your spirit? Or where shall I flee from your presence? 
If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me. For you formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. I praise you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. My frame was not hidden from you, and I was being made in secret, intricately woven in the depths of the earth. Your eyes saw my unformed substance, and in your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there was none of them. So we look at a new year, we take confidence, and we take delight in knowing that this year uh, was ordained by the hand of God, and we worship him uh, with that sweet thought in our hearts and our minds today. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we, we confess and we do it with great joy that you know us better than we know ourselves. You know every uh, success and joy that is ahead for us in 2022. You know every trial and difficulty. And, and Lord, we have confidence that everything that happens in this coming year is from your hand, and that everything that happens in this coming year, uh, you have promised to bless so that your glory might result in our story. You know, you've made this promise to those who trust in Jesus Christ as Savior, and we hold on to that promise very dearly. Uh, we don't know what's coming tomorrow, but we do know that you will be with us, and we can never run away from you. Bless us with your presence this morning, we pray, as we worship you anew and afresh in 2022. It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Well, please stand as the worship team prepares to lead us in song this morning. Now and forever, how 
Please remain standing for our scripture reading this morning. Well, we're going to be back in Acts uh, today, and we're going to be reading from Acts chapter 17, 1 through 15. We'll begin with verses 1 through 9. Uh, you read the highlighted text. I will read uh, the non-highlighted text. The word of the Lord. Now, when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. Good job there. I gave you a little extra reading for this new year today. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. They could not, and when they could not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have turned the world upside down have come here also, and Jason has received them. And they are all acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. Sin, who know no sin, let 
we might become his righteousness. He humbled himself and carried the cross. Love so amazing. Love so amazing. Jesus was so for our second scripture reading, and we're working our way through our deacons, and some of our deacons will uh, be moving off of the deacon board, and so I want to give them an opportunity to lead us in the reading of scripture. This morning, uh, our deacon uh, chair, Rick Paredes, is going to come and uh, lead us in the reading of Acts 17, verses 10 through 15. The brothers immediately set Paul and Silas away by night to Brea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now the Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining scripture daily to see these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, not with not a few Greek women of high standings as well as men. But when the Jews of Thessalonica learned that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea, also they came there too, agitating and stirring up the crowds. Then the brothers immediately set Paul off on the way to the sea, but Silas and Timothy remained there. Those who conducted Paul brought him 
as far as Athens. And after receiving a command from Silas and Timothy, they came to him as soon as possible. They departed. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Would you continue worship uh, together with me uh, by lifting our prayers to the Lord this morning? Lord God, what uh, wonderful songs to sing in a new year. Uh, to know that these truths are, are just as true as they've ever been. And yet we need them to be true afresh and anew. Uh, Lord Jesus, Messiah, you are uh, the, the name above all names. Uh, the, the precious Lamb of God who takes away our sins. God, you are a God who is with us always and will never leave us or forsake us. And a God who is always ready to hear our prayers as a good heavenly father listening to his children. Lord, hear our prayers this morning. We first of all thank you, Lord, for the ways that you are at work that we see uh, among us and we see in, in ways uh, that, Lord, encourage us in the ministry I think this morning of our Sunday school teachers that, that teach here in our church, uh, Rodney and, and Wayne and Dan, and Lord, we pray that you would continue to enlighten them by your Holy Spirit, that they might understand and apply your word. We think too of those who serve as missionaries, Lord, that we have the pleasure and privilege of uh, supporting, and this morning we think of Brenda Lyons, who, Lord, works in Frontiers uh, uh, missionary uh, organization serving Muslims and uh, her in particular Lord gets the opportunity to um, meet with pastors meet with families that are out in some of the hardest places in the world for Christ and Lord would you continue to help her as she has that support ministry uh, with frontiers we think too of those who serve uh, right alongside us and other churches part of our denomination and this morning we pray for Pastor Earl Phillips and Park Presidio Bible Church in San Francisco. Uh, Lord thank you for uh, their ministry and their church. We pray that you would uh, continue to make them a light in dark places and Lord that is certainly true uh, there in San Francisco in ways that uh, we have hardly imagined before. Lord hear our prayers. We also, Lord, thank you for the ways that you've answered prayer. I thank you personally in my own family that uh, we've been recovering from this uh, RSV-type virus, and it's sent Bonnie to the hospital. It's run through our family a couple times now, and yet, um, Lord, the, our girls are, are all doing better. Uh, we continue to pray for little Holly, who is uh, kind of having some difficulty on the back end here, as well as myself. But Lord, we do thank you for answering our prayers. We thank you too for uh, Mike Ochoa. Um, we've been praying for him. He was hospitalized with COVID-19, but now is home from the hospital. And Lord, we thank you uh, for answering our requests for him. Lord, we also have a great many um, requests that some are, are still on our hearts and we can't help but bring them up before you together as a church. Uh, some are new. We continue to pray for the McLaughlin family as Richard's memorial service will be this Thursday here in our church. Lord, please give them your comfort and a peace that surpasses understanding. We pray for the Carter family as Pastor Tom's mother, Helen Carter, passed away on Christmas Day. And her funeral is going to be on the 11th over in Menlo Park. Lord, she... Uh, made it, I think, 102 years, or almost 102 years. And Lord, what a, what a life that you have given um, in this family. And Lord, would you give your comfort to them as well? We think, too, of the family of Carolyn Long, who I just learned over the weekend, passed on the 23rd. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to visit with her. And Lord, thank you for her uh, joy in Christ that was evident in that visit. We pray too, Lord, um, 
just heard yesterday that Dan and Eric Dollar's father, Jerry Dollar, has uh, worsening congestive heart failure, and he was hospitalized last week, and uh, it just things are not going well for Jerry. Lord, they, they just lost uh, their mother and Jerry's wife, Judy, last month. And Lord, they're just experiencing sorrow upon sorrow. Lord, would you uh, raise them up by your grace and your mercy? Dwayne and Sharon Johnson aren't here this morning. And Sharon, Lord, has been declining in health for some time. We've all seen that. But Lord, um, just over the weekend, she was put on hospice care. She probably has uh, some more time with us, and we pray you would make those times sweet. But be with Dwayne, especially as he seeks to care for his wife. And Lord, would you, uh, uh, w- would you give him wisdom about any next steps he might need to take? Lord, we also pray for relatives in, in our church, and we think of Barbara Arona this morning, too, the cousin of Jessica Sandoval, who was hospitalized with COVID-19, and they found blood clots in both of her lungs. Uh, She has been dealing with uh, various types of cancers over the last several years, and this is very unwelcome news. And Lord, we pray for your healing. We pray for your mercy. Please deliver her, Lord. Father, we give these requests to a God who loves us more than we can ever understand. We give our praises and our supplications to you because you have power to effect real change and because, Lord, we know that when we ask of a Heavenly Father who cares for us as much as you do, you will respond with grace and love and compassion and truth. Lord, hear our prayers and we know that you do in Jesus' name by whom we pray. Amen. At this time, children can be dismissed for uh, children's uh, classes, and they are also welcome to to stay here if if they'd like to remain, but our uh, children's uh, teachers will be glad to take them upstairs uh, for the remainder of the service, if you'd like to do that. Uh, We are going to uh, continue worship by giving our tithes and offerings to the Lord and doing so in thanks for the God who gives us uh, good gifts. He says this to us as we prepare for that giving. In James 1, verse 17. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Let us now worship in the giving of our tithes and offerings.
I think I'm, no, oh, there, there I am, okay. Well, now for the, the message this morning. Uh, well, as we've already mentioned, it's 2022. Uh, 2022 years since the birth of Christ, actually probably 2026, it's another issue. Uh, nearly 2,000 years, not quite, but nearly 2,000 years since the death and resurrection of Christ and the beginning of the church, which we are studying in the book of Acts. There's much that we can look at in the world and say that, well, things have become very much different than they were 2,000 years ago. Uh, but there's also much that's the same. And the things that are the same are things which ultimately matter. The trinkets and the toys that we carry around, uh, our medical advances, and even our industrial world have, have made life very different in our day and age. But our relation to God, our relation to one another, and our relation to a lost world is very much the same as it has always been. We confront the same challenges, the same temptations, the same resistance. We see the same God at work, turning hearts, changing minds, speaking by his word, a word that's been around for much longer than 2,000 years. This is exactly what we are going to be focusing on in our message this morning as we get back in the book of Acts after our Christmas season. We're going to see the responses of man to the gospel and the God who is still at work amongst those responses. Now, when we last left Acts, let's do a little bit of uh, geography here and a little brush up. When we last left, we read of Paul who had separated from Barnabas and set out on his uh, second missionary journey. Uh, you can see on the map, it might be kind of hard for you to see, but that purple line that's kind of towards the top there is the, the line that we are following uh, as we are work, working our way through the teens uh, in Acts in the last couple chapters. And uh, that purple line, it starts in Syrian Antioch all the way to the right and heads westward. Now, at the beginning of Paul's journey, he set out to encourage and check in on the churches that he and Barnabas had already started uh, in Galatia, that area in the green, uh, Pisidian Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, Derbe. And he went there to encourage these churches. But he also continued on further to evangelize. Uh, he, he was prevented, for some reason, we don't know why, by the Holy Spirit from going west into the red area, which is Asia Minor, towards the coast, he was also pre prevented as he went north from going into that light green area of Bithynia uh, for an unknown reason. Uh, so what did he do? Well, he had to go the back way uh, through what is uh, Asia Minor and modern-day Turkey until he came all the way to that port city at the top left of Asia Minor called Troas. And it was there that he had a dream, a dream of a Macedonian man calling out to him for help a call that was from God, and that led him across the Mediterranean to the Roman province of Macedonia, which is modern-day Greece. Led him to the city of Philippi, where Lydia came to faith. Led him to the city of Philippi, where he and Silas were imprisoned and then had a miraculous escape from prison, or at least a release from prison, that led to the faith of the Philippian jailer. It led to the confrontation with unjust authorities in Philippi that were taking advantage of Paul's situation. It gave us courage to do the same. But it's next that we read of their travels through Macedonia to Thessalonica and Berea this morning, and this is a little bit uh, zoomed in view of that same journey uh, to Thessalonica and to Berea. And what we're going to see in these cities, it sounds very, very similar to what we've already seen uh, before, and it also reveals two completely different responses to the gospel of Christ. And we're going to begin with the negative one. 
the negative response, the deceptive tactics of a mob mentality. The deceptive tactics of a mob mentality. Now, we're introduced to the problem in our text in verse 5 with these, uh, these people that are responding negatively to the gospel. The Jews were jealous. Uh, please note, uh, uh, we've said this before, that when, whenever you see in the New Testament the phrase, the Jews, it's most often referring not just to the Jewish people generally, but it's referring to the Jewish religious leadership. And in particular in this context, it means the religious leadership of the synagogue in Thessalonica. Why are they jealous? Well, Paul was being used by God to convert many of the Jewish people and devout Greeks and leading women to be part of the church. That would mean that these people are going to follow Paul's teaching now and not the teaching of the synagogue leadership, and they couldn't have that. Jealousy from religious leaders has been a repeated theme of the book of Acts and of, <coughs> excuse me, the, <laughs> the gospel. Uh, at the very beginning of the church, we see this in Acts chapter 5, uh, verses 14 to 18 says, And more than ever believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women, but the high priest rose up and all who were with him, that is the party of the Sadducees, and filled with jealousy, they arrested the apostles and put them in public prison. When Paul was preaching in Pisidian Antioch uh, in just a few chapters ago, in chapter 13, it says this, when the Jews saw the crowds, the crowds that were listening to Paul, they were filled with jealousy and began to contradict what was spoken by Paul, reviling him. And there in chapter 13, these are the same religious leaders who invited Paul and Barnabas to speak in their synagogue. But when they got a little too uh, popular, when they got a little too... Uh, productive in their evangelism, they had to confront it and work against it. And we can point to many other times when the religious leadership persecuted the church, most likely with the same jealousy in their hearts, it's just not specified, it's not explained in other passages. And it reminds us of the exact same thing that, that happened to Christ, which Christ predicted would happen to his own. Matthew 27 says, so when they had gathered Pilate said to them, the Jews, the Jewish leadership, whom do you want me to release for you, Barabbas or Jesus who is called Christ? For he knew, Pilate knew, that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Even someone like Pilate can see the obvious motivation from these leaders. And as Proverbs 14.30 says, a tranquil heart gives life to all flesh, but envy makes the bones rot. Indeed, this jealousy leads them down a path of, of rotten and deceptive tactics. We'll look at each one uh, that we see in the passage. <coughs> First of all, verse 5. Uh, they intentionally sought out wicked men of the rabble, uh, and they used them, or they told them, to form a mob and set the, the whole city of Thessalonica in an uproar. Then they follow Paul from Thessalonica to Berea, to do it again in verse 13. They, they see Paul's over there and they have to do it again to them. Now back in verse 5, they also became violent and they attacked the house of Jason uh, where the Christians were meeting there. When they could not find Paul and Silas, they forcibly dragged Jason and some other Christians before the city authorities in verse 6. They shouted their charges <laughs> with the force of a mob behind them and without any thought of due process. Again, much like what the crowd did with Jesus, crucify him, crucify him. If their concerns were legitimate, they, they would have been about the Bible and whether or not Jesus was the Messiah, but the, that, that is not what they present at all. Uh, they have less than honorable, deceptive, and rotten motivations, and they certainly do not want to reveal that to these authorities. Uh, Paul and, or Jason and the other Christians are only freed then on bail which may show that the authorities there in Thessalonica had less than honorable motivations uh, for putting them under arrest. They were sure to, to profit from this situation while at the same time appeasing this mob. Now, it, it's, it's a very good thing, um, it's a very good thing that this doesn't happen in our time, right? Thank God that was 2,000 years ago, and we don't see things like that anymore. 
Thank God that we're in 2022 and we're a more mature, civilized society. Right? Well, uh, to have a little bit of fun with this, I've got a couple Babylon B articles, Babylon uh, parody articles here. Uh, one of them uh, says this, Twitter. The title says, Twitter introduces a new send mob feature. <coughs> Let me read this here. It says, in response to the frequent and passionate requests from a handful of users, Twitter announced a new send mob feature for its popular social media platform. Now, whenever a Twitter debate uh, gets particularly heated, Twi Twitter's algorithm will automatically enable a send mob button, allowing users to send an angry crowd to their opponent's location. <coughs> Excuse me. Quote, for years, Twitter has been at the cutting edge of tearing people apart for having different opinions from you. After a series of trial tests, <coughs> we are pleased to release this new feature to the public knowing that there could be no downsides <coughs> there we go there could be no downsides whatsoever to enabling unbridled impulsive rage uh, quote honestly we didn't really have any choice said twitter ceo jack dorsey two or three blue checked twitter users threatened to deplatform me if we didn't add this feature uh, unquote twitter says they are also testing a tar and feather feature which event with eventual plans for a guillotine button now here's another one. This one says, uh, judge instructs jury to ignore angry mob outside threatening to burn down courthouse. <coughs> With closing arguments uh, completed in the Kyle Rittenhouse case, the judge is now giving the jury their instructions before they, they deliberate, reminding them to ignore the angry mob that is currently outside threatening to burn the whole building down. Quote, please be fair and impartial, he said to the jurists who were all wearing Kevlar helmets and body armor. <laughs> Quote, just ignore the bloodthirsty mob of communists threatening to terrorize you and your family forever if you don't find Rittenhouse guilty. That should not factor into your decision at all. Unquote. Guilty or we burn it down. Guilty or we burn it down, replied the mob outside, furious that they were being ignored. The jurists have asked for a 20-minute head start to get in their cars and drive to the nearest bomb shelter before the verdict is revealed. They have also asked for 24-7 armed security provided by Kyle Rittenhouse. <laughs> Catch my breath here. Now, as uh, funny as those are, and, and th these parody articles are, th they are a little closer to truth uh, than maybe some people might think. We know that Twitter and other social me media platforms are regularly used to shame, to cancel, to track down, and even to attack people. We know that any court case uh, having to do with hot button issues in our society will be met with large crowds that threaten violence and sometimes act in violence. And we know that this same kind of mob mentality permeates our daily lives. Social media is the most obvious place for this. If you go against the grain, you may very well be slandered by a Twitter mob or by individuals who have adopted a, the mob mentality of our time. Uh, we also live in a world where fear of that same <coughs> kind of reaction is present in our non-Christian relationships <coughs> and even within the church, even within the church on some issues. Uh, we've talked about this much in recent years. I don't want to belabor these points. And on the other hand, we should also say this as we look at a new year. I think there is also a growing disdain for this mob mentality throughout our society. Uh, there's a distaste that I believe most people have, even if some are too afraid to admit it. This is instructive, I think, for us as we interact with non-believers and even as we interact with others within the church. The quickest way to avoid this mob mentality is to humble yourself and to listen. James 1, 19 to 20 says this, Know this, my beloved brothers, let every person be quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. For the anger of man does not produce the righteousness of God. How about that for a New Year's resolution? But this text also has to be held together with a passage like Ephesians 4.15, which says, 
rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ. This means two things. This means that we, we must have a humble, sober tongue that is not constantly trying to be heard, number one. But we also need to be able to speak the truth. This means we need to speak all of the truth of God, too. As Paul writes just two verses later in Ephesians 4, he says, Now this I say, and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. Thus, the kind of listening we are called to do is very different from how some defi define listening. Some define listening by merely hearing what someone says and accepting all their ideas, all their feelings, all their experiences without any feedback, without any discussion, without any judgment, to just listen and shut up. That same kind of statement is made inside of the church on some issues. Biblical listening, however, not only closes its mouth to hear the other person, but also listens with the goal of encouragement in the truth and encouragement in Christ. Biblical listening assumes the ability to respond, <coughs> to respond graciously, to respond in love, to respond with compassion, but to respond with truth. <coughs> Ooh. Otherwise, listening alone will lead to tacit approval of the futility of people's minds and an enabling of people to believe and live lies. It's a very difficult rope to walk, isn't it? Perhaps in a new year, people all will be more willing to have open and honest conversations. But we must resolve to take that initiative ourselves. Not just for the purpose of bettering the relationships we have with, <coughs> with people. <coughs> but because we want to make inroads for the gospel. Because we want to have greater unity in Christ with our brothers and sisters. We've got to be prepared. We've got to understand. We've got to fight against the deceptive ta tactics of a mob mentality, both when we see it in the world outside of here and when we see it in ourselves. And we can counteract this by listening. But there is a particular kind of listening we are directed to have in this passage as well. It's a listening to the word of God. So let's look at our next uh, point, our second response that we see in Acts 17, and that is the enlightened study of a reverent mind. The enlightened study of a reverent mind. Now this is actually the first response. It's the first response we see both in Thessalonica and in Berea. And we see it both in the evangelism that Paul uses, and we see it in the response of, of some of the believers to that, or some of the people to that who are believers. In verses 1 through 3, Paul goes into the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ, that is the Messiah promised in the scriptures, to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. In verse 10, uh, we see in Berea that there's a much shorter description of what Paul does in his evangelism, but we can assume that the same thing happened there uh, in the Jewish synagogue that he went to, because as verses, uh, verse 2 says, that this was Paul's custom, or, or this was the way that Paul primarily evangelized. Three verbs describe it in verses 2 through 3. Uh, these terms are variously translated, too. Uh, in the ESV, we start out with reasoned, and that could be uh, defined as either discussed or argued. Uh, we also see explaining, which could also be defined as opening or interpreting, uh, which is particularly relevant to the scriptures. And then finally, proving or putting before, demonstrating. But what's most important to note about Paul's approach is that he did all of this from 
the scriptures. Paul was calling on God's people to study the scriptures and there to find the gospel. And he did this for three Sabbath days. (coughs) Three weeks. He took his time. He focused his evangelism where the people would be gathered around the scriptures. Now we can certainly point out that he probably had conversations with people before and after these Sabbath synagogue teachings, but his customary focus was on these meetings, places where the scriptures could be explained and demonstrated to the people. He wasn't using man's reason either as a basis for believing in Jesus. He was not teaching elaborate philosophical truths. He was letting the people hear from God. He was letting the Spirit speak in the power of his word. Now, some might object to this and say this is due just because he was talking with Jews who already accepted the word. Uh, But even in Athens, which we'll see next week, (coughs) if I can get through this sermon, Paul brings scriptural truth to bear in his evangelism every time he evangelizes. Why does he do that? Well, Paul tells us uh, some of the reason why in 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1, 17 says, For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. 1 Corinthians 2 says, And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming to you the testimony of God with lofty speech or wisdom. Paul's careful in whatever he's doing, he's careful to make sure that his evangelism was not based on the wisdom of man, the rationality of man, or the lofty speech of man. No, it, it must be the simple message of the cross and the resurrection, and this message must be substantiated by God himself. It must be a message from God and not thought up by man. It could even be preached by somebody who can't say a sentence without coughing. It's the word of God that has the power. It's the word of God that must be central to our evangelism. Proving this gospel message is not of us, but it is is of God himself. And this is the message that Paul was able to explain and prove clearly from the scriptures. That it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead. And he said, this Jesus whom I proclaim to you is the Christ. He is the Messiah. That's our message. It's our message every Sunday. It's a necessary conclusion of all of Scripture for the promised Savior to come, to die in our place, to rise in victory over the grave. It's the summation of, of every text that we encounter, of all of Scripture put together. We see it in the very first story of the Bible, which makes clear that mankind fell into sin and that we now live in a world under the curse of God because of that decision. Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock. To the woman he said, I will surely multiply your pain. To Adam he said, cursed is the ground because of you. This is a complete change of the way things are ultimately meant to be. It's the obvious evidence that we have that this world is suffering. This world is under God's judgment. This world needs a Savior, a Savior that God would provide. Isaiah 53 says that he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And of the resurrection, Paul said this in Acts 13, quoting other psalms when he was at Pisidian Antioch. He he showed from the scriptures. As for the fact that he raised him from the dead, no more to return to corruption, he has spoken in this way. I will give you the holy and sure blessings of David, Isaiah 55, 3. 
Therefore, he says also in another psalm, you will not let your Holy One, your Anointed One, your Messiah, see corruption. Psalm 1610. This is God's message to all of us. We are sinners under the Father's judgment, living in a dying world, but he has provided our salvation. He has provided our eternal life through his promised, prophesied Messiah, the Son of God, Jesus Christ. The Bereans take Paul's evangelism to heart, and in verse 11, they examine the scriptures as Paul presents it to them daily to see if these things were so. They didn't look within their hearts. Uh, they didn't consult contemporary philosophy or, or even ask other Jewish religious leaders for their advice. They actually studied the scriptures. They had a genuine interest in the truth of the word of God. And this group included a variety of people in Berea, among whom there must have been some religious leaders too. Not all of them persecute the church. As we look ahead to a new year, is this our conviction about the teaching of God in his scriptures? Will we continue to eagerly examine them to know that these things are true? And to know in the face of many trials from the world and many temptations from our own hearts, uh, the disdain of non-believers, the difficulty of my own failures, my own failures that caused me to question if the cross was enough, my own internal doubts, how much do I really know about this? These things we will face constantly, year after year. The question is, will I hold tightly to the word? Will I examine them with eagerness to see what God has said, to confirm my faith, to give me courage to face another day, another year, to give me confidence in the face of my friends, my family, to, to share, this is what God has said. This is what he says to you. This is what he says to me. We see two responses here in Acts 17, two responses that couldn't be further apart, but what made the difference between them. Uh, were some of these Thessalonians and many of the Bereans just, just better people? And what is it that separates people today? We, we certainly see these two responses. We certainly see mobs, and we certainly see people who have been changed by the word of God. Uh, but well, the difference is this, our last point, the eager faith of a regenerated spirit. The eager faith of a regenerated spirit. Verse 4 of chapter 17 says this, that some in Thessalonica were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks and not a few of the leading women. Verses 11 through 12 say that of some in Berea, <laughs> Excuse me. Of some in Berea, it says this that these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, with not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. The key difference here is in this summary statement of verse 12 that many of them therefore believed. This is what God is calling on all men and women to do. To believe, to believe that it was taught in the scriptures necessarily that the promised Messiah would die and would be resurrected, would die in our place, would rise for our eternal life. To believe that Jesus is that Messiah, he is the Christ, he is the Savior, he is indeed the Son of God, the only worthy substitute for my judgment, the only one powerful enough to defeat Satan, to defeat sin, to defeat death to believe in Jesus. Again comes the questions. Well, why were the people persuaded and uh, why did they join the church? What made these Bereans more noble? 
Why did they receive the word of the gospel with all eagerness? Why, why did they believe? Why have I come to faith? Well, another passage of Paul makes it clear and demonstrates the work of God in our lives. Chapter 2, verses 4 through 5 say, My speech and my message were not in plausible words of wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, so that your faith might not rest in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. God demonstrates his power by working in your heart to believe, by working in your mind to be convinced with eagerness that these things are true, to open your heart to receive the message of the gospel, uh, to believe in Jesus as your Savior, that he still speaks, and he does so directly to you, to your heart, from his scriptures. And for those who already believe, he continues to work to give you the same eagerness you had at the beginning, the same faith you have had before and year after year, and the same confidence in the word of God that gives us this gospel. The question for you, the question for all of us is, is God speaking to you? Is God opening his word to you? And what is your response? Maybe it's to believe in Jesus for the first time in a new year. To know, yes, he is speaking to me and I feel like he's speaking to me for the first time. Probably for most of you, it's just to have a renewed commitment in 2022 a renewed commitment to the, the wonder of God's word, to have eagerness in the gospel and in God's truth, and to come expectantly Sunday after Sunday, to come expectantly in your own room as you open up the word, waiting for God, looking for God to speak, and knowing again and again that he is the truth. What we see in Acts 17, what we see in the world today are two responses to the gospel, deceptive tactics of a mob mentality and the enlightened study of a reverent mind. But what changes, what produces the right response is the eager faith of a spirit worked on by God. Would you pray with me? Holy Spirit, I do believe and I've believed for a long time that you have spoken to me. You spoke to me when I was a junior high kid who could care nothing more than to hang out with the girls in youth group, come to church because I had to, but you broke through by your word and you spoke. Because of that, I stand here today and I still believe because you still speak. For a great many other people in this room, Lord, the same is true. You spoke countless times and maybe some times in particular where it was so clear it was so obvious that the living God was opening your heart, revealing your truth. Lord, may we hold on to this with great celebration, with great joy as your people. For anyone today who maybe feels like you are speaking for the first time, Maybe you have spoken several times and it wasn't until now that you made their hearts ready to receive this message with eagerness, to believe in Jesus as Savior, 
to say, Lord, I am a sinner. Save me. Lord, we together say the same thing. We believe. Thank you for speaking to us. It is in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit that we pray. Amen. At this time, we're going to continue worship. We're going to do so in celebrating God speaking to us and God changing us in sharing from the communion table together. In a minute, we are going to, uh, I'm going to read from a passage of scripture to prepare us for that. <coughs> but you should also know, I'm not going to touch those elements. Some of you might be wondering this whole service, like, oh boy. Uh, I'm going to stay up here. I've got my own uh, juice and, and bread, and I've asked the deacons to distribute the uh, elements themselves, and uh, I will start us off with a reading of Scripture, uh, which tells us what we are doing uh, when we remember the body and the blood. 1 Corinthians 11 says this, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Whoever, therefore, eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. In light of this passage, I'd like to give us a moment of silent prayer before we partake of the Lord's Supper. A time as we reflect on uh, a year that has gone before us and one that's coming ahead to confess our sins to the Lord and to celebrate that they are forgiven. Would you pray with me one more time? Lord Jesus, thank you that we don't partake of the bread and the cup now to get saved again or to, to keep it up, to get it back. We do so joyously and humbly aware that, yes, we are sinners, but you have finished. You have finished our sin. You've forgiven it all. You've given us life eternal. And we celebrate that together now as your people. Bless, Lord, uh, this communion service. In Jesus' name, amen.
says to all of us, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. says to all of us, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this in remembrance of me. Please stand as I give the benediction. I'd like to give uh, a pretty traditional, the most traditional benediction as we begin a new Sunday in a new year. (coughs) I think I could say it. (coughs) Almost there. Aaron's blessing, the Lord says to us, the Lord bless you and keep you. 
May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Our God is an awesome God.